The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There may be spoilers. This episode is scripted by John Ruths, Leah McKayla, Chris Boyce, Liza and Newell Fisher. It includes both quoted and adapted text written by John and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 95 recorded on a rainy Christmas Eve Eve with building work going on next door, in which we will be looking at the first story from part one of Tales from Watership Down, chapter one, The Sense of Smell. I need to particularly thank John and Leah for what they wrote about this tale over the summer, as this has proved invaluable in the difficult circumstances I have had to develop this episode under. First though, I've had a lot of feedback after last week's episode. As we are changing gear with the subject matter so much at the moment, this week's burrow keeping is going to be extended, so bear with me. First of all, I had this reaction to starting tales from a listener in the US called Liza. Quote, I'm so excited that you're finally to to tales. I heard that some people don't like it, but I want to submit a hopefully short and completely anecdotal defence. I like to keep it in mind that these books were to whatever degree aimed at children, and I was a young child when tales was released. In no way was I disappointed. I adored it as as much as I did the original work. I love the stories, but I was a child who read a lot of folklore and mythology, so maybe I was more receptive to the structure than other people. More importantly for me, the stories did for me what the original did, just as as vividly and profoundly. They helped me contextualise and process my experiences. They reflected back to me things I knew, felt, but couldn't yet understand or deal with. In particular, the story of the hole in the sky was and remains a touchstone for me. I experienced a life-threatening situation as a child. It changed me and the way I interacted with the world, and it left me feeling utterly alien. I don't know any other children or adults, to be honest, who understood the impact of that sort of thing has on a person. I remember reading it and feeling so deeply, profoundly understood. It gave me the words to describe my experience, and even now my husband and I both understand immediately when one of us describes someone by saying they just haven't seen the hole in the sky. Even if Tales wasn't what people wanted or expected, I think it's a wonderful compilation of brilliant mythology and folklore. I had bullfinches and had Tales from Watership Down, and although I love both, I preferred the latter. Not a deeply researched defence, but a heartfelt one. I hope you don't mind receiving this sort of unsolicited feedback. End quote. I always welcome unsolicited feedback, Liza. After all, what other kind is there that really matters? And I'm very happy to see tales being defended. For me, it has always been a very mixed bag, but each to their own. We all come to such works with different life experiences, and those shape our reactions to them. And Liza, welcome to the Owsler. Chris Boyce, on the Warship Down fans Facebook group, wrote about the order in which the stories of Elacrara were written in relation to the main narrative, seemingly in response to Leah's comments in last week's episode, a topic that comes into sharp focus as we start looking at tales. Quote, My thoughts are based on a number of things. All the indications point to Elacrara being no part of the oral story originally told by Adams to his daughters. They might be able to shed light on this. As far as I can tell, the stories were added while writing the novel, at that time not called Watership Down, of course. It appears to be a common fan misconception that there must be a well-developed backstory, the true original story from which an author or other creative is drawing part and telling it to their audience. In the context of this discussion, that takes the form of an expectation that there was a reservoir of Elacrara stories pre-existing from which Adams drew as required. I very, very much doubt that is the case. He would have simply written the stories on the fly when he felt the novel needed them. There may have been one one or very unlikely a couple or few unused stories from the time of writing the novel that became Wardship Down, but even that I doubt. On the flip side, we know that Adams did not write all of Tales in one hit in the 1990s, At least one story, The Rabbit's Ghost Story, had been written in the mid-1970s and published in the early 80s. Why it and possibly others were written, I cannot say for sure. In the mid-70s, Adams may have been toying with the idea of writing a sequel to Watership Down. If so, it's pretty clear that any return to Watership Down was not the one we got in Tales. The style, tone, attitude and content is too different, as and is, in my opinion, consistent with the over 25 years between the two. On the other hand, if the intent was... A 1970s sequel, would one or more Ella Herrera stories have been the place to start? My opinion is no. Maybe the ghost stories written under standalone sequelette, maybe for a magazine or for a probably different anthology to that in which it was later published. However, 
I think Adam's own description of his intent in Tales is the most likely. He wanted, for some unclear reason, but maybe just for his own satisfaction, to round out the lore and culture he had hinted at in The Watership Down. Maybe he wrote several of the stories we read in Tales in the 70s, or maybe he wrote them on and off as the years went by. And maybe he wrote nothing more until he decided to embark on writing Tales. My view, it is likely to have been a steady accumulation of the stories until he had had enough to put them together as a lore anthology, and only then added the sequel material to give enough material for a book. Tales from Warship Down. One thing that I feel feel supports this is that there is no attempt to integrate any of the stories into the sequel material, and that all the stories are standalone. There is no chronology or continuity. They are ordered by type rather than in time of telling. In short, Tales looks and reads like an anthology of only loosely connected stories, the connection obviously being the Adam's world of Watership Down. End quote. Thank you for those observations, Chris. Just imagine if a sequel to Watership Down had come out in the 70s. What a book that might have been. Lastly, with reference to the Warren of the Snares being actually located under a graveyard in the 1984 Australian Broadcasting Corporation radio play of Watership Down, Leah Michaela has written the following about rabbits in Finland, which, al- which also refers to the episode on the evolution of rabbits. Quote, in Helsinki, feral rabbit population infested a, r- a graveyard during the first decade of the 2000s, and there was quite some newspaper pieces about rabbits digging tunnels through the graveyard and making headstones fall. After all, graveyards are often located in places where it is easy to dig, though rabbits and humans might value easiness of digging for different purposes. Last year, I got into an online argument with someone who said Wikipedia lists wild rabbits existing in Finland as such, and therefore using the term feral is offensive. So I might add that the entire wild rabbit population of Finland derives from offspring of abandoned pet rabbits in the late 1990s. And I use the term feral mostly to describe the state in between domestic and wild, as in the height of Helsinki rabbit population, also colours of domestic rabbits were often to be seen. Of course, blacks and harlequins more often than some lighter ones, as some colours are better camouflage in the wild than others. RHDV entered Finland in 2016 by itself, apparently with insects, and mixed mitosis followed in 2019. So nowadays, the Helsinki population is much smaller than it used to be, and there hasn't been news of rabbits raising, raising havoc in graveyards anymore. However, there have been some signs of rabbits in the wild surviving those diseases and developing immunity, so time will tell if there sooner or later will be a bigger rabbit population again. I've heard that's what has happened in Australia several times with different viruses. End quote. Thank you, Leah, for a modern example of how domesticated rabbits became wild rabbits, as happened in Britain. I also need to correct the figure of 63 million years ago I gave for the meteorite that killed off most of the dinosaurs. The most up-to-date figure seems to be 66 million years ago. Finally, before we get down to business, I need to give a brief but important note to giving credit to contributions to the podcast. When I began this podcast in March 2021, it was entirely scripted by me. That situation continued over the summer of 2021, during which John Ruth got in touch and started sending me notes on each chapter. These became more and more detailed, which became absolutely crucial when at the end of August last year, my life suddenly hit a huge crisis that, to be honest, could have meant the end of the podcast. I've made light of this before, but that was the reality. John's notes saved the day, and I was able to start just editing those for my voice, and most of the episodes on the second half of the original novel were basically written by John, who had no issue with my changing his words as I saw fit. That is what earned John his well-deserved captaincy of the Owsler. I returned to scripting for the 1978 film, though the extensive notes John had sent me on that were used as backup for any ideas I had missed. The script was mine, but his help merited acknowledgement. Since that time, I've made sure that I credit anyone whose words are used unedited or mostly unedited as as having helped write each episode. Both John and Leah Michaela sent me extensive notes on tales from Warship Down during this year, his focusing on the plot and hers on mythic and folk themes, and where these are used more or less verbatim, as they will be at times, I'll give full credit accordingly at the start of each episode. When I quote contributors directly, I already make that clear. But when contributions are extensively edited by me, I will refer to those as adapted text at the start of the episode, rather than saying quote, end quote, within the episode itself. No one has asked me to say any of this. I just feel it is only right to make absolutely sure that full credit for contributions is given, as well as the the nature of those contributions. So then, with all that said, let's get into our first tale. Part 1. Chapter 1. The Sense of Smell. 
The first thing we learn as we begin this tale is that Adams is, was still a fan of those pre-chapter quotes that any true Wardship Down fan is enamoured of, which makes their absence from my Kindle edition rather disappointing. However, they are present in my Penguin 1997 edition and in the version John Roos was reading. There is an interesting mix of two quotations with this first chapter. One is from Psalm 115 of the Bible. The line about noses they have but they smell not is from a larger set of passages that all seem to reference a nation that is not in tune with God, relying on idols instead. Though this quote works in isolation, thematically it doesn't really fit the theme of the tale that follows. Then again, that was that always the case in the original novel? The other quote is the well-known motto of the UK Special Air Service, one of the very first military special forces in the world, born out of the courage and audacity of British soldiers to attack airfields from barren desert in North Africa, when attack from the sea became impossible in World War II. Who dares wins is an admired motto and has been used in many other nations around the world. But could it not have been Ella Herrera's own motto right from his first confrontation with King Darzin over lettuce? The first tale could not open in a better way than with the line, Tell us a story, Dandelion. We are back immediately on our beloved down. It's a fine May evening on Watership Down during the spring following the defeat of General Woundward. We learn, much to our relief, that Kiha is present. He meant it when he said he would return. And in a single page, Adams treats us to a general recap of events in Watership Down, with many of our heroes discussing the events of the previous year, though their conversation is reported rather than quoted. And again come the cries demanding that Dandelion, the speedy bard of this now well-developed Warren, tell another story. He does not immediately do this and ponders of it. This pondering is also to be relished and was well earned. It comes only from being the best storyteller in the Warren. Eventually, he begins with a story that apparently none of them will have heard before, which is odd, as this opening section of the book is supposed to consist of stories, quote, which all rabbits know, end quote. In this story, rabbits at one time could not smell. While we know the blessings that Frith bestowed upon Ella Herrera included fast hind legs, long ears, good for hearing, and a shining tail that last and least might not seem like a great asset. At any rate, there's nothing in there about a rabbit's sense of smell. Even Ella Herrera feels the need to consult with an older rabbit in, of this warren. This does feel just a bit odd, though. Wasn't Ella Herrera the original rabbit of Frith's creation? So it feels a bit strange that he's seeking out advice from a rabbit that seems older than him. The first overt reference to an older generation in the original novel comes at the end of Ella Herrera's return from the Black Rabbit of Inlay, where many years have seemingly passed for, for the rabbits of his home warren, even though for Ella Herrera and Rabscuttle far less time has passed. Yet in the first tale after the blessing of Ella Herrera, told at the Warren of the Snares, there is a reference to Ella Herrera being able to alter his smell before his meeting with King Darzin in disguise as he tries to steal his lettuce. So in the first tales of Elacrara we heard, rabbits had the sense of smell right from the start, it seems. In any case, he consults with Heartsease, who remembers once sheltering a swallow that pitied the rabbits for their lack of smell. You probably can't fully appreciate what you don't have, but Elacrara does recognise that this hurts rabbits in not being able to find food, and also in not being able to smell a lil. He learns that there is a land of darkness where creatures called eyelips live in caves and guard the sense of smell. Ella Herrera travels to see Prince Rainbow, and we are once again treated to this character that we're never quite sure of, but I think we readers are better off for it. The prince gives some advice about trying to seek for the sense of smell, such as not letting any creature there know he doesn't have it, and also gives Ella Herrera what he calls an astral collar that was given to him by Lord Frith. Off Ella Herrera goes the next day to the land of darkness. Not being sure where he was, he simply waits until another creature is sensed nearby. This creature refers to itself as a glanbrin, and it seems that rabbits and glanbrins are not aware of one another's existence, although it seems like they might actually be similar. The glanbrin smells Ella Herrera, and Ella Herrera pretends to smell the glanbrin. He does sense, though, that the glanbrin seems to be blind, or nearly so, which seems to make some sense in Land of Darkness. Ella Herrera discusses that he's here to see the eyelips, and glanbrin, the glanbrin is a bit spooked by this, as they are apparently carnivals and use evil magic. However, we know that Elohara is a very determined rabbit and leader. He's already made this trip to a very unfamiliar place. He's not easily dissuaded, as we know. The Glambrin agrees to guide Elohara to the eyelips. He does not really want to, but really admires Elohara as much as we do. It comes out that Elohara has no sense of smell. Along the way, we learn that Elohara thinks that Glambrin must, be, must really be the rabbits of this world and similar. He learns that Glambrin has a mate that left him for another that, that seemed to be bigger and stronger. 
This is why the Glambrin seems rather solitary, the way a hare in our world might live. The trip was tough on Elacrera due to both darkness and his lacking the ability to smell his surroundings. But if he had never had a sense of smell, wouldn't he have compensated over time with, for example, his hearing? The Glambrin takes Elacrera as far as he dares and agrees to wait for two days. At their parting, he refers to his new companion as Friend Glambrin, and we are possibly reminded of Bigwig's parting from Hazel just before he entered Ephrafa. Now without the Glambrin, Elacrera finds it hard going. Fumbling along, easily startled, uncertainty, and also faced with solemn, si solemn silence. At this point, I wonder why we don't yet know the Glambrin's name, although we then know the name of his former companion, Flaregold, and even the name of the Glambrin, Shindike, who supplanted him. Onward he went, sensing that even trying to get back might be maddening. A creature much larger than him happens by. Elacrera is recognised as being Glambrin-like, and it's clear that Adams wants we readers to see Glambrins as the rabbits of this world. He soon finds out that it is indeed Ilips who've intercepted him, and our hero is in great fear, as you might expect. Prince Rainbow's astral collar gets some attention. Do we know exactly what this might be? Not really, but it doesn't really matter, and like Prince Rainbow himself, it's more intriguing to wonder a bit. It does seem that the Ilips know who both Prince Rainbow and Frith are. Clearly, Prince Rainbow's gift ended up saving Elacrera's life. The Ilips ask him if he stole it. I found this interesting, and I'd guess that maybe it's because Glambrins are also the clever, agricultural, good-natured thieves that we know our rabbits are. As things turn out, the Ilips used to be the guardians of the sense of smell, but no longer are. Now Elohera has to go see the king of yesterday. This knowledge more or less floors our hero, and you can imagine him thinking something like, now what? As things further turn out, it was a good thing that the Ilips picked him up, as they'll now take him to see the king. Elohera will ride on the Ilips' back. They plan to also intercept the Glambrin who guided him there. Sharing the story of the Glambrin's loss of his companion, the Ilips agree to take him to see her. Naturally, Shindike runs off at the very smell of Ilip. Flaregold takes her old mate back. Elohrara and the still nameless Glambrin part ways, and you suspect that Elohrara has made a friend for life. Getting to the destination, or as close to it as the Ilip can get, the Ilip departs. Soon, Elohrara sees an old gate enters it, and is greeted by something similar to a rabbit called a potteroo. They talk, and Elohera asks, is asked if he is an English rabbit. Why, yes, he is. However, this is another example in the tales of Elohera of something a rabbit surely wouldn't know, would know nothing about. How would rabbits have any concept of the human political divisions of a particular island? This is a bit odd. And surely Elohera is the father of all rabbits, much like the father of a nation, but it seems he might only be the progenitor of English rabbits. A heron helps them across a river. They are now in some sort of field, and Elohera encounters something like a cow, and this is actually the king of yesterday. He is described much as a buffalo or bison, and a bison he really is. And now an unexpected twist. All the creatures in this king kingdom are actually extinct, and now the name of yesterday makes sense. Interestingly, American bison nearly became extinct with just over 300 of them in the late 1800s. There are now half a million of these in the US, so they definitely bounce back to some extent. Elacrera introduces himself to the king as an English rabbit. We are reminded that Elacrera is, is sometimes not exactly as he appears to be when he states that he has the blessing and protection of Lord Frith. That's not totally true, but this is our hero who is out to save his people after all. The king takes off on a walk, and Elacrera accompanies him. Elacrera feels a bit of pride as there are no rabbits in the kingdom, indicating that extinction was and is not an issue in spite of having a thousand enemies. The king remarks that humans are the cause of all extinctions. No surprise there, unfortunately. Even the growing forest correlates to the forests that we humans destroy daily. Apparently, Lord Frith even spoke to the king of yesterday about appointing yet another king of the trees. They pass by various animals that were likely at least perceived to be extinct by Adams, and it's certainly a neat idea for this kingdom. Soon the king will start a meeting and address the rabbit's lack of sense of smell. However, even the king cannot confirm this. This is OK and runs consistent with an underlying theme of this story. Doing hard things are rarely simple and often require multiple points and methods of coordination. At some point, a gazelle from the land of the king of tomorrow borrowed the sense of smell and it was never returned. Naturally, and much like this kingdom, the land of tomorrow is far away and tough to get to. A wolf, definitely one of the thousand, volunteers to transp transport the fairly frustrated Elacrera. This is a Kenai wolf, meaning from the Kenai Peninsula of Alaska, 
Basically, this is a timber wolf, and they were also nearly extinct. North of where John Ruth grew up in Minnesota, they were once shot on sight in decades past as pests. The very friendly and accommodating wolf gets him as far as he can, but because he is extinct, he cannot enter the land of tomorrow. Entering this kingdom, Elohara eventually locates the king's court, as well as meeting a koala bear with a broad Australian accent and dialect. Compared to the kingdom of yesterday, the land of tomorrow is teeming with activity and seems almost crowded and maybe a bit disorganised. Elechrara is not happy because it seems impossible to gain an audience with this king. His mood does not last for long as he tries his hand at a rabbit trick, diving into a large bowl of quicksilver or mercury in order to draw attention to himself. The king here is a huge stag and Elechrara, after a struggle, finds himself in front of him. His trick works as the king notices his glittering fur. As happens a few times in this story, Elechara must answer the normal who are you and what do you want questions, the basic answers being I'm Elechara, English rabbit, here to get a sense of smell for my people. The king ponders about giving rabbits the sense of smell that Elechara is looking for. Our hero exclaims that if he gets it for his people, that they'll then go on to be a great scourge of mankind. The other animals cheer. Even though this land is made up of animals who are not extinct, the idea of what humans do to animals is clearly on their minds. Elechara gets what he's after. Of course he does. The fact that the King of Tomorrow uses the word be it so to do this is special and harkens to the story of the blessing of the Velakrara received from Frith that make up the Warship Down creation story. As soon as the sense of smell hits him, Elechara is exhilarated, and the way Adams writes about this is also pretty special. He is carried home by yet another member of the Thousand, a Golden Eagle, another member of the Alil from the US. Back home, presumably somewhere in the green and pleasant land of England, Elechrara sees Rabscuttle at last, and it seems that all his subjects can now smell. When rabbits are out seeking Flayra, they are to remember that when they smell it, that it also helps them fulfil Elechrara's obligation to the King of Tomorrow. Is it canon? John Ruth writes the following, quote, This is a fun story. It's filled with what seem like inconsistencies, but we must remember that this is a story formed from rabbit mythology that then incorporates other mythologies. We must forgive those oddities. Case in point, many religions have what is called a flood myth, although there is physical evidence that there really was a flood thousands of years ago. Was the entire earth flooded or just regions in our current Middle East? Why do multiple similarly located religions possess a flood myth? Possibly because it really happened. Do we need to pass out what each religion has to say about it? We can, but not really. As mentioned before, I thought of Elechrara as the founder of all rabbits, as, see, as in planet-wide. In this story, he is the father of English rabbits only, apparently. Another oddity. I'd guess that rabbits did not have a sense of smell only in their earliest days. Yet, here is Elechrara visiting the land of yesterday, chatting with animals who are not considered extinct until the 19th and 20th centuries. Another oddity. In this cast, a time and space oddity, but one that I roll with, as we say in the US. I also remember when the Black Rabbit told El Herrera something like, like, there is no time here, indicating that time was not an element that they, need, they needed to worry about. Is it possibly the same in this story? El Herrera's sheer determination and steadfastness matches that from Wardship Down when he tried to match wits with the Black Rabbit. The takeaway here is that El Herrera is a leader who is good, emphatic, responsible and determined. This story still serves to inspire rabbits everywhere, and maybe most especially chief rabbits. We meet a lot of interesting characters in this one story. A Glambrin, who is much like a rabbit, and my personal favourite, given the way the Glambrin connected to Elechrara. Kings of lands who either have animals and plants that were caused to be extinct by humans, or those who are essentially thriving but maybe always trying to stave off the demise of their species. We get to meet various animals deemed to be extinct, although in some cases just rare. It might have been neat for Elechrara to have encountered a carrier pigeon, or maybe a dodo bird. Various animals help Elechrara, who were clearly members of the Thousand. We never learn what the Ilips are either. They are still killers, but maybe because they are extinct in the land of the present? Please take note that he encountered no velociraptors, brontosaurs, triceratops, T-rex or any other dinosaurs. All of the animals encountered seem to be post-Ice Age. The best myths not only attempt to answer a question, but also serve to hearten those who hear it. I think that this is the case with this story. Leah Michaela writes, quote, The first tales in Tales from Warship Down 
the sense of smell and the story of the three cows seem to be written to match the general genre of wonder tales with the hero sent to a quest to fulfil a task, meeting supernatural helpers along the way, in settings more and, and or less supernatural as well. I ended up peeking also what there was in Wikipedia about props morphology, a structuralistic approach to folk tales, and ended up, ended up amused by how these first stories and tales seem to be written to formula, trying to tick off as many of the listed functions as possible. Apparently that morphology, or list of functions, is used to some extent as a reference guide for scriptwriters of various TV genres as well, if I remember it right. However, in this context, it seems to be used to create a likeness of such tales as the theory is written about. My first impression on the most recent reading is that the first story reminds me of some Norse fairy tales, not least because the potentially dangerous eyelets that turn into helpers resemble the role of trolls and bears in them. The worlds of darkness, yesterday and tomorrow, seem to be just as well layers of the other world and that a sh the shaman dwells through as the worlds of different cows in the second tale were, though more filled with various helper spirits. I also stop to wonder whether that part of Ella Herrera diving into quicksilver is some sort of reference to alchemy, though in a way being re reborn through quicksilver parallels to being reborn through the magical milk lake in the following story. Reading these right after the original Warship Down, it strikes me these are quite different in tone, but I didn't remember how esoteric some of these tales seem to be. Trickster seems to have given away to Shaman in these, and that may play a role in the absence of Rabscuttle as well. I've been wondering whether some of the original Warship Down El Herrera stories might have had some reference to Aesop's fables, and maybe Tales of a Thousand One Nights, and came to think I'm not so familiar with those, so I got myself a pile of fables and fairy tales from the library to read this summer. I also suspect Br'er Rabbit may have more than one or two tricks in common with El Herrera. End quote. So, is it canon? Well, this first tale is very, very different to any tale of El Herrera we have counter encountered so far. Even the standalone tale of Rousby Woof included Rabscuttle, as did the most shaman-like tale in the original novel, that of the Black Rabbit of Inlay. So, on balance, I must say no. Not canon. This tale, that most rabbits both know and don't know, is too far removed from what we have become familiar with in the original novel, which doesn't mean it isn't a good story, of course. However, there is one small feature that comes right at the start that is worthy of consideration. The brief and incredibly welcome confirmation that Kihar did indeed return to Watership Down is a beautiful moment in amongst the warmth of our reintroduction to the Down, and I nominate it without hesitation. I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, or whatever the preferred phrase is at this time of year in your culture. Next time, in the second of the tales from part one, Elohera meets three cows. Mm -hmm.